Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. You can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com and by the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Every year they host experts from around the world to present the latest research happening in the field of paleontology. You can get more information at tyrrellmuseum.com and view previous speakers on YouTube. This week we have Dinosaur of the Day, Stygi Moloch, and a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, as always, we like to thank some of our patrons, and this week we would like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Janice, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Ray, and Oliver E. And Oliver E. just joined, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining our community. If you want to be part of this growing group of awesome people, our fellow dinosaur enthusiasts, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Yeah, and we're about to give away a Velociraptor sculpture too. The sculpture is courtesy of TRX Dinosaurs, and it's super realistic. It's one-to-one scale, putting it at just over six feet long and two feet tall. And it's got a huge fan of tail feathers. It's got wing-like arms. And, of course, the awesome Deinonic kid <laughs> or raptor claws on its feet, which are super cool. Yeah, it's also incredibly lightweight. Yeah, because it's made mostly out of foam. So it's super easy to transport. Yep, and we had it in our house a little before we left for Taiwan, and... It shocked a few people coming in. Yeah, (laughs) it is surprising to see when you don't expect it in like a living room, for example. But it's, you know, relatively, it's six feet long. It's not that hard to fit in. Like you could fit it on a shelf since it's only two feet tall or put it in all sorts of places. I'm sure you could find a way. Oh, yeah. You know, you can definitely fit it. It's just the how realistic looking it is. And if you're not expecting to walk into a house and have a dinosaur greet you. Yeah. So a little bit about our giveaway. Unfortunately, due to legal restrictions, we can only offer the sweepstakes to residents of the U.S. and Canada, excluding Quebec, and there is no purchase necessary, not surprisingly, because you don't really buy anything on this podcast. And we are also offering free shipping, so all you have to do to enter is you'll click a link in the show notes. There's a link in this show notes, and there will be a link in every show notes, up to and including episode 186, which will be on June 20th, also known as two days before Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom comes out, because that's kind of partly what we're doing here, (laughs) celebrating the movie. And you'll be able to enter by clicking the link, and you can click the link that will be in each show notes, and each show notes will be a separate entry to win, all the way up until June 22nd at 11.59 p.m. is when it's all going to close, and then we're going to add up all the individual entries. So if you clicked on the link for every show notes between now and June 20th, then you'll get that many entries, one for each. And then we'll do a random drawing and whoever gets selected wins. So obviously if you have more entries, you're more likely to win. So we'll do the drawing sometime that weekend after the sweepstakes close on June 22nd at 1159 p.m. (laughs) And we'll announce the winner on Monday, June 25th on Patreon. So if you won, you can go to Patreon and see. And just some legal jargon. The obligatory stuff. Yes. It's void where prohibited by law, including in any country or jurisdiction where sweepstakes are not legal to operate, or in any country, jurisdiction that would require the sweepstakes to be registered and or bonded with a governmental agency or other regulatory body. Also, in order to enter, you have to be at least 18 years old, and the complete rules and restrictions are on our website. So yeah, don't forget to click the link in the show notes if you want to be entered to win this awesome Velociraptor. It's valued at $500, which is pretty awesome. And Thank you to TRX Dinosaurs for giving it to us. Yes, thank you. I'm a little sad we're giving it away, but... Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I'm sure it'll go to a good home. Yeah. (laughs) So jumping into the dinosaur news, as much as we'd like to talk about our Velociraptor sculpture for hours and hours, (laughs) we move on to more pressing news. 
First up is an article by Andrew Knapp and others published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. And what they were looking at is why ceratopsians grew so many different sets of horns. And by that, I mean, I don't mean an individual with different sets of horns. I mean things like, why does Styracosaurus have such different ornamentation than Triceratops, for example? So if you're not familiar with all the different Ceratopsian horns, there's a lot more than just what Triceratops had. They do often have brow horns as well as a nasal horn, but sometimes they also have cheek spikes. They can have very large frills. They can also have horns and bumps on the edge of the frill and varying levels of all of these different ornaments. So the authors point out that, quote, a number of hypotheses have been suggested for the presence and evolution of such ornaments, including predator defense, mechanical support, thermoregulation, social or sexual signaling, and species recognition, end quote. And the authors think that there's been enough research to rule out predator defense, mechanical support, and thermoregulation, which leaves us with species recognition and sexual selection. So species recognition would be for, say, as an example, you've got a lot of animals that kind of look similar, but only some of them are in your species, so you're going to have successful offspring with them. You're going to want to be able to tell that they're in your species. Seems like a kind of crazy thing to think of as a human, <laughs> because as humans, everyone we see that looks like a human like we don't a need, human. Yeah, there's <laughs> nothing similar to us. But with things like birds, there can be a lot of birds that look pretty similar. So it's helpful for them to have a very characteristic marking that's like, oh, yeah, that one's in my species. So potentially these horns could be for something like that. You see the certain pattern of horns and decorations around the edge of the frill, and then you know they're in your species. And then obviously for sexual selection, what we're talking about is the bigger and more outrageous the ornamentation the more impressive it is or potentially for combating with mates maybe use those big horns to sort of compete for a mate it's hard to say exactly how they would be using it but in that sort of mechanism not just recognition so both hypotheses interestingly use the horns and frills as ornaments and not as like you know mechanical support or defense or something a little more physically useful. It's more of a display structure. The authors point out that since there aren't any obvious gender differences, meaning you don't see half of them with larger horns or something like that, that could indicate that it's for species recognition. Because oftentimes if everything in the species looks similar, that's how they're identifying each other, whether males or females. And another way of describing that is sympatric evolution. And sympatric evolution relates to if you have multiple groups deriving from the same species sort of evolving together that are closely related in the same space, then you need to somehow differentiate from one another. And they decided that there were two tests that would be the most helpful for determining if they were doing sympatric evolution. One of them is that there's random species splits for these new ornaments. But then they said that could also exist with other types of evolution. There's often random variation. The more useful study that they could do is how closely related species with different ornaments in the same place seem to evolve. And that's really the focus of the study. So what they're looking for is, are there bigger differences in ornamentations with these sympatric species or species living in the same place than there are with ceratopsians that were living in different places? Because if the driving force is recognizing one another, you're going to have more pressure to develop these sort of display structures when there's a lot of other <laughs> ceratopsians around that you need to differentiate yourself from. So what they did was they gathered up to 350 data points wow. of all known valid ceratopsian species. That's a lot. Yeah. And I say up to because they can only gather it if they have the information from the bone. So if you're missing part of a bone, then you might not be able to measure it. And these could be things like the length of horns, the width of horns, how many horns there are, how long different parts of the frill are, all that kind of stuff. And then it also included non-display or internal features. So that's things like, you know, sizes of vertebrae and lengths of legs or internal ribs and stuff like that, which doesn't seem to be used for display. And actually, most of the features were these non-display features because only 86 of them were display characteristics. 
Then what they did was they threw out all of the ceratopsians, which were too incomplete. So they narrowed down the 77, what they considered well-established ceratopsian species, down to 46 species, which is still quite a few species. And mostly the ones that got thrown out were kind of the more boring-looking basal or older ceratopsians. No. They, yeah, they didn't have like big, exciting ornamentation anyway, so it's not particularly useful for this test anyway. Yeah, what good are they? Yeah, yeah, not, not any good for this at least. <laughs> and if you're good at combinatorics, you know that if you have 46 species, you have 1,035 possible pairs of species. So in other words, if you're comparing two species and trying to see how they relate in terms of what sort of ornamentation they have, the 46 species combine 1,035 different ways. And about one in 10 of those pairs could have happened, meaning they could have been in the same time and place or contemporary as they describe it. Friends. Could be, yeah. <laughs> or trying to avoid each other like frenemies. <laughs> what the results showed was really interesting. They plotted out all the different levels of ornamentation versus how derived they were and sort of how similar they were. And they didn't find more ornamentation within the sympatric species. So that means that even when they were being really picky about which pairs to include, meaning which pairs were around at the same time, they didn't find that the ones that were living near each other looked more different from each other than ones that lived in totally different places. And therefore, it didn't seem like they were evolving just for species identification. And since the only other option left in their list of five was sexual selection, that's probably the most likely reason that ceratopsians had all these big horns and frills and stuff like that. Oh, that explains all the headlines. Yeah, there were a lot of headlines about this. <laughs> but it's kind of funny because the authors didn't really talk that much about it. Even the title of the article is really about the fact that they negated the sympatric species evolution hypothesis and not promoting some other hypothesis like sexual selection. The authors also pointed out that sympatric evolution in modern species is always what they refer to as low cost. So basically that means coloration. <laughs> and this exists in birds and some other animals. So it's like facial markings or feather color, things like that. That's what animals tend to evolve if they're just trying to identify a species. Whereas Huge horns are obviously not low cost. We've talked before about how bone is really costly for an animal to maintain because it has to constantly be repaired and basically replaced. But maybe coloration was also happening. That's just kind of my aside because they did have these big frills. So maybe within these ceratopsians, you could have some selection based on the coloration on the frill. Just random speculation. Like billboards on their foreheads. Exactly. Yeah. It would be a convenient place to show off colors. <laughs> but obviously that doesn't apply to this study at all because they're just looking at the bones and the things that are currently named as different species. And it doesn't look like they were evolving just for species selection. Another interesting thing they point out is that you see a similar sort of ornament divergence from the ceratopsians as you see in the scarab beetle genus Anthophagus, which is pretty interesting if you think about these beetles if you've ever seen a scarab beetle oh yeah like in aladdin i want to say yeah <laughs> they were also in that movie the mummy with brendan fraser not they were like good. eating a body or something like that because beetles you can use sometimes for eating dead tissue but in any event it's interesting that there's some sort of similar corollary where you can see these big structures evolving for sexual display but it's on such a tiny scale <laughs> The biggest flaw, though, with this whole sexual selection thing is what they alluded to earlier, and that's that we don't see any sort of sexual dimorphism, meaning difference between males and females, because usually you don't see both males and females with big display structures. Usually it's just the males. Occasionally it's the females, but usually in nature it's the males. I'm thinking that maybe this is because species where both individuals, both parents are involved with raising the children, or I guess whatever the... The offspring. Yeah, the offspring, that's a better word. They tend to look more similar. It's kind of an interesting thing that happens a lot of the time. At least it happens with some species. So maybe that means that ceratopsians kind of raise their offspring together. I don't know. Wasn't there a... We talked about in a recent episode about how 
I forget what kind of dinosaur, but the females looked really similar to the males, and that was so that predators wouldn't target them. Oh, yeah, that was one of the other hypotheses. That's an interesting one. Yeah, so, I mean, we're going to have to, if they're going to go down this rabbit hole that, yes, it's sexual selection that is causing these sort of display structures, you have to account for the lack of dimorphism one way or another, because that is the most common way we see it in modern animals. So, be interesting to see what it is. Up next, we've got an article by Michael Frederick and Gordon Gallup, Jr., And they're both psychologists, which is relevant because they're talking about how dinosaurs might have had a psychological deficit. What? (laughs) Yeah. So this article was in Ideas in Ecology and Evolution, which is a journal published by Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. And I had never heard of it, so I read a little bit about the journal. They had some, I want to say, troubling It's not the best sort of things you read about in an about section of a journal. They say IEE does not publish traditional review articles or papers based primarily on experimental data-driven studies. That's one of the lines. (laughs) And that it's not based primarily on mathematical or quantitative modeling. So really what they're saying is they're doing very kind of out there. Speculative. Yeah, very speculative kind of stuff. That's a good word for it. And yeah, they even have a line where they say that they want to serve effectively as a catalog for models and empiricists, as well as for educators and the media from which they can shop for original ideas and hypotheses that have been subjected to critical evaluation and response by professional biologists, etc. So it almost sounds like they're intentionally making clickbait, but... <laughs> They do come up with some interesting ideas in these articles. I glanced at a few of them. But this one was making headlines all over the place. And I want to point out, it is just this sort of very out there hypothesis. It is not any sort of rigorous theory. And no paleontologists were involved with it. So it's very, very preliminary. So it's more of a thought experiment. Pretty much. It's like a r slash shower thoughts sort of (laughs) (laughs) article. But it was peer reviewed by somebody, apparently. Basically, what they're doing is these authors are building on the Sakamoto article about the gradual disappearance of dinosaurs. And we interviewed him back in episode 75. And he talked about how they did a statistical analysis of dinosaur species throughout the Mesozoic. And they found that in the Cretaceous, it looked like dinosaurs were declining in speciation events already before the mass extinction. And basically, that might mean that dinosaurs weren't doing as well in the Cretaceous as they were in previous periods in the Mesozoic. Did they get too big? Perhaps. When we asked him in our interview why he thought it might have happened, he said, well, maybe it's rising sea level, which meant that there was less land area and less migration and possibly leading to less speciation. Or it could have been because they had been around for such a long time that they were no longer really speciating as much because they kind of stabilized. And yeah, he did kind of mention that maybe the size thing was an issue. But he did say that they probably would have continued well after the impact, just not really thriving at the previous levels that we had seen dinosaurs thriving at, which was pretty dominating every ecosystem. And they were still pretty much dominating all of the land in the Cretaceous. So they weren't doing poorly, just not quite as fabulously. They went from like an A plus to an A, I think is basically (laughs) what had happened. That doesn't sound too bad. (laughs) No, it really wasn't that bad. And we also talked a little bit previously about how dinosaurs might have eaten hallucinogens. This was another article where they discovered that angiosperms evolved during the Cretaceous and one of them appeared to potentially have hallucinogenic effects. And it was, I think, maybe even discovered in some gut contents of a dinosaur. So you could interpret that to mean that maybe these dinosaurs were hallucinating or otherwise affected by the things that they were eating. And if you combine those two thoughts, along with some random speculation, you can get to the idea that maybe dinosaurs were declining because they were accidentally eating poison, which is basically what this hypothesis is. So it's kind of out there. But they did do an experiment that I really enjoy. So they raised 10 caimans, which are crocodilians, and they raised them all on beef. 
because I guess that's what caimans like to eat. And then they split the caimans into two groups of five. And they fed one group chicken and gave them a shot to make them sick. So they injected them with something that just made them really nauseous. And then they fed the other group beef and gave them the same shot. So now you've got two sets of sick caimans, but one of them just had a change in their diet that they had never eaten before in their life. Then they waited for them all to recover, and then they fed chicken to both of them again. And so what you might expect is the one that got sick after eating chicken for the first time might be like, oh, I don't want to eat that chicken. I've only eaten chicken once before, and it made me sick. But the one that, you know, ate beef and got sick might not think anything of it. But what they found was that they all basically just gobbled up the chicken, and it didn't seem like the ones that got sick from the chicken the first time, ostensibly, learned anything from it. Sure, but... I've done that myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this sort of behavior is well known and it's known as food aversion. And most animals, most modern animals, I should say, because we can test this, do develop food aversion in this sort of situation. So, for example, birds develop food aversions. There have been previous studies with jays. And what they did was they fed them monarch butterflies, which apparently when they eat milkweed, they incorporate the toxins into their body and then when they're eaten, they're like poisonous, basically. And what happened with these jays is pretty funny. After the jays ate these monarch butterflies and got sick from it, if they even just saw a monarch butterfly, they would start retching. So they got oh, sick no. just by looking at them because the, it just reminded them of that time that they got sick. Wow, good memory. Yeah, it's pretty cool considering you don't think about birds as being that... Not cool for the jays, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... In another aside, they had lots of cool anecdotes like this. They clearly know what they're talking about with regards to this food aversion hypothesis or a theory, really, because it's well established. For example, with mammals, mammals can often smell toxins and otherwise identify them. But some mammals are less good at dealing with toxins. And one of those is rats. So rats can't regurgitate. So what they have, what the authors call ingestional neophobia. <laughs> And what that basically means is a fear of new foods. Oh, no. And so it's because they can't regurgitate. So if they eat something that doesn't get along with them, they just have to deal with it. Yeah. And hope that they don't die, basically, because they can't get rid of the toxins any other way than just digesting them fully. Oh, uh, that's rough. Yeah. So what rats do is they'll eat a tiny bit of something if it's new to them. And then they'll test themselves. They'll just wait around and see if they get sick. And if they get sick, they won't eat it, and they'll remember to never eat anything like that again. But if they don't get sick, then it's just game on, and they'll eat a whole bunch of it. And that's why rat poison apparently doesn't work that well, because rats will taste the poison and see if they get sick. And if they don't, then they'll just... Smart. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Doesn't sound like the ideal way to live, but <laughs> no, they worked with what they have. Yeah. And they also mentioned, it's really interesting, this whole rat poison thing, but apparently their learning of what not to eat is super robust because even if you knock the rat unconscious so it doesn't feel the effects of the poison that much, it'll still know not to eat it again. And also, if you give them electroshock therapy to make them forget all of their recent memories, they'll forget everything else, but they'll still remember what not to eat. So it's a, it's a very robust mechanism that these rats are using to learn what not to eat. They also, speaking of mammals, talk about humans I'm just going to read exactly what they wrote because it's great. They say, when novices overindulge and get sick on a specific alcoholic beverage, they often develop robust learned taste aversions to that particular beverage. Oh, yeah, Malibu. Yeah, for Sabrina. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny because a lot of people do have one drink that they drank too much and now they'll never drink again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's taste aversion. And we know that humans have it too, obviously. So mammals are obviously pretty good at this. It helps if you have a good sense of smell or vision, obviously. But the authors suggest that dinosaurs may not have had this taste aversion. And when we talked to Sakamoto about this, because we asked him for his comments, since it's largely based on his work, he said that this is a pretty speculative sort of leap because they talk both about birds and caimans, and they're basically saying because caimans don't have this, dinosaurs probably didn't have it. But dinosaurs are also related to birds. So why would you make this sort of tenuous attachment with caimans? It's kind of weird. But the authors also suggest that sauropods were so big that they had to eat everything all the time. 
and didn't have time to do the sort of thing that mice do or rats do of eating a little bit and seeing if they get sick because they just had to eat nonstop all the time. Including maybe turtles. Yeah, <laughs> or poisonous plants <laughs> in their thinking. But yeah, I don't know. That's pretty weird. And then they also said that large predators had nothing else to eat except for things like sauropods, and therefore they would be eating these sauropods that had been poisoned, and then they would get sick and die, and the, it would collapse, which is weird. They sort of made this connection that most dinosaurs are big, and therefore most dinosaurs would have to eat other dinosaurs, but if something dies from poison, it's going to be in its stomach, and I don't, I don't know if dinosaurs are eating each other's stomach contents. That seems kind of weird. I don't know necessarily that these toxins would be present in the meat that you would eat and get poisoned by. That, another really kind of speculative leap. And on top of that, we had ceratopsians and hadrosaurs that both rapidly evolved in that period, and they're both herb herbivorous groups. So if there are all these new poisonous plants popping up, why are two new herbivorous animals starting to thrive? It's very strange. And both of them have dental batteries, which has previously been used as support of them maybe eating angiosperms. Although these authors say that it was the opposite and that they were eating seeds and could avoid the angiosperms that were poisonous because of that. But if they ate seeds, wouldn't they have lasted longer? We've talked about birds and the reason that modern birds don't have teeth is because the ones that survived that extinction event could eat seeds yeah well that's what they're saying is the ones that ate seeds were the best off oh okay but it is weird because then they're saying why would you say that these hadrosaurs and ceratopsians went extinct because if the birds survived because of eating seeds why didn't the ceratopsians and hadrosaurs evolve survive while eating seeds it's really strange and on top of that sakamoto also pointed out why do they think the angiosperms were poisonous? There's no evidence of angiosperms being poisonous. We know that one was probably hallucinogenic, but there's no evidence of widespread poison in plant life during the Cretaceous or any other part of the Mesozoic for that matter. I wonder what a dinosaur that was hallucinating would have seen. What if it was a ceratopsian, bringing it back to your first story, hallucinating, and then all the bright colors, if there were bright colors on the frills, can you imagine? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> You're connected some weird dots right now. <laughs> it's just fun to think about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There could have been a lot of hallucinogens. I mean, it's really not preserved very well. And the authors try to sort of get a grasp of how we might find out that there were poisons or I guess hallucinogens all over the place. And their main suggestions are you look for toxins in dinosaur-sucking, amber-trapped insects. What? Yeah, so like the idea is if there's toxins in the blood of a dinosaur and then an insect sucks the blood out of that dinosaur and gets trapped in amber, then there would be toxins in that bug. And hopefully, since it's preserved in amber, you can now get that toxins out. Does it last? That sounds a lot like Jurassic Park it to does, me. It does, exactly. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would last for 66 I million years. I just hear Mr. DNA explaining it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and All then, the toxins. <laughs> yeah. And then the other example that they came up with was maybe there would be traces of toxins in the fossilized dinosaur bones, which again, I don't know why something eating toxic plants would be eating it long enough if it's lethal to incorporate into the bone at all. But even if it did somehow, the idea of it lasting for 66 million years through the fossilization process, very, very low. And it seems like the kind of thing you'd want to see before writing a paper about how you think these toxins were killing dinosaurs. Any sort of evidence of dinosaurs being poisoned in any way might be useful. A couple more holes that I would like to shoot in this hypothesis because I think it's important. There were also a lot of dinosaurs that were very small, even though some of them were large. A lot of them ate mostly insects. Some of them ate fish. Some of them ate mammals. All of them went extinct too. Why did that happen if it was primarily because of this poisoning event? It just doesn't really feel like a robust hypothesis in any way whatsoever. No, but it is interesting to think about. It's kind of fun. It is fun. And it's kind of useful more than anything 
because you can kind of point out some of the flaws in it and think about the scientific method and what you would have wanted to see if this were to be true. One more note that I want to make that Sakamoto gave us was that lots of other animals also went extinct at the KPG boundary, which these authors kind of glaze over, and a lot of them were not eating plants. Like, even when we talked to Sean Gulick, he mentioned that the largest plankton went extinct back in the KPG boundary. So there were all sorts of things going extinct that had nothing to do with eating plants, especially plants on land. And, you know, you also had things like mosasaurs and aquatic things that were not able to eat angiosperms. So, anywho, pretty out there hypothesis. It's really interesting, though. I like the idea that there are some animals that learn what they can and can't eat and others couldn't. And they're definitely, I mean, it seems like there must have been a time when plants were first evolving poison that there were some animals that couldn't figure it out and probably died because of it. But I, it doesn't seem likely that it was huge swaths of a huge group like Dinosauria over millions of years. It seems like this would be a much shorter sort of period and probably more isolated. I also think that dinosaurs are more like birds. And if birds can tell the difference, dinosaurs probably could. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that was kind of a fun article. And it was so widely published that I wanted to go over it. Okay, now that we're out of that rabbit hole, I have a much, that was a rabbit hole. I have a much shorter one by Thomas Raven and Susanna Maidment, and they published an article in Pure J all about Paranthodon, which is a dinosaur known from Africa. And it's not really new. It was found way back in 1845, but they did describe some new material. <laughs> Originally, they described the top front of the mouth and a small piece of the top of the snout or nasal, but they skipped describing a piece of the vertebra, and really it was just a quote-unquote extremely fragmentary part of a vertebra, which might be why they skipped describing it in the original papers. And when I say they, it is not these two people because they weren't alive in 1845. <laughs> but <laughs> it is now being described by these authors. And the reason they decided to re-examine Paranthodon is because... There's been a lot of new stegosaurs found since the last examination of the species back in 1981, and they wanted to see if it's still considered a stegosaur because there's been a little bit of back and forth about what species and genus it belongs to. And long story short, they do think that the vertebra supports it being a stegosaur, and they actually think it's a close relative to Stegosaurus, everybody's favorite stegosaur, pretty much everybody's, although it's about 20 million years younger than Stegosaurus, and it's from South Africa versus Stegosaurus is primarily from North America. And that's not really too difficult to figure out because Africa was still connected to South America at the time, and it might have been able to mosey on over to Europe or maybe down through Mexico and make its way over into Africa. And on top of that, there was that fun little article a year or two ago about how Stegosaurus might have been able to swim based on those prints that they found in the UK where it looked like there was a stegosaur sort of transitioning from walking into swimming as its feet were like barely scraping the bottom. Which is a crazy find if you think about it. I really hope that it's true and not just like some interpretation of something much more simple. Yeah, but all the thing, I mean, every fossil is like this, but all the things that had to happen to get a fossilized track of stegosaurs going from walking to swimming. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. So there you go. If you're a big paranthodon fan it's probably a stegosaur so you know what to draw in your fan art <laughs> there you go that's the moral of that article we're going to take a quick break from the news for another word from trx dinosaurs which as garrett mentioned before they make posable and animatronic sculptures and puppets and of course they've also made the velociraptor that we're giving away yeah, I wonder if anybody wants to get a Stegosaurus sculpture. Oh, that'd be so cool. Yeah. I can imagine the plates and then just how lightweight that would be compared to, oh man, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm still amazed at how lightweight that Velociraptor is. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it only weighs a couple pounds. It's really light considering how huge it is. But since he makes everything to order, 
you could get a paranthodon even, although we know very little about what it looked like, so you could probably make it look just about however you wanted. Basically make your own dinosaur. Yeah. It would probably look a lot like a stegosaurus since they think they're closely related. But the coloration options with all the plates are pretty cool. You could do bright green plates. Who knows? Whatever color plates you can think of. You could do a ceratopsian and make the frill whatever colors you want. Yep. Yeah, ceratopsians are an even better example because technically, this is a little bit of an aside, but a lot of these unique colors people think started showing up with angiosperms because that's when new flowers and these chemicals called keratinoids started evolving. So like pinks and purples and blues and stuff like that started showing up. So ceratopsians might have been able to incorporate that into their diet and have some really pretty colors. So if you're ordering a ceratopsian from TRX, the sky's the limit in terms of colors. Yeah. (laughs) Potentially. That's true. Yeah. So if you would like to order your own sculpture, head over to trxdinosaurs.com or puppet or animatronic, I should say. And if you want to follow their progress of their current builds, head over to Instagram at trxdinosaurs. Which I definitely recommend. There's some great videos up there. Yes. And remember to click the link in our show notes so that you can win your very own Velociraptor from TRX Dinosaurs. Speaking of Instagram, thank you to Marcos who shared this one with us via Instagram. So researchers and students at the University of Kansas recently excavated a young T-Rex from the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. And they found the upper jaw with all the teeth, parts of the skull, foot, hips, and backbones. They're going to need to analyze it thoroughly to know for sure if it's a young T-Rex or the article said some other type of Tyrannosaur. I guess they didn't want to be too controversial, but they mean (laughs) Nanotyrannus because there's that controversy. And it could help show evolutionary relationships since a young T-Rex probably looked very different from an adult T-Rex. They think that it's a T-Rex because of its teeth, but they're going to need to compare it with their Kansas University's older T-Rex specimen to know for sure. And they're also going to need to determine for sure if it's a juvenile or an adult. And if it's an adult, it could be a nanotyrannus. Uh-oh. But again, not everyone agrees that nanotyrannus is a separate genera. But this is exactly the kind of find that could help determine whether nanotyrannus is a separate genus. Because if it's an adult nanotyrannus or a juvenile T-Rex, then that really swings the favor one way or the other on whether or not they're spe- separate genus. Genera. Yeah, good point. So be good when they publish their findings. Could be a while, though. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> These things take time. In North Carolina, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina, recently unveiled a clutch of Oviraptorosaur eggs, which are apparently the only ones found in North America. And the museum's paleontologist, Lindsay Zano, and her team found them back in 2016 in Utah at a nesting site. And they were in between two thousand foot mountains so they had to chisel out the eggs and then they had to use a helicopter to move them out in a plaster shell so far they've taken two eggs out of the chunk of rock and there might be up to 10 more and the team's going to be working on them over the next year in their glass walled lab so if you're visiting you can watch that is awesome yeah they also made a really cool video of the excavation so you can see them helicoptering it out of there and the site that they pulled these eggs out of it's just crazy they said usually we carry out our finds but it's too rugged and when they showed it you're like yeah i don't even know how you climbed over that without carrying eggs it's just it was rough (laughs) there's some rough terrain over there but it's beautiful makes for really cool pictures and videos it does also shows you how passionate people are about their work (laughs) yeah risking life and limb to get these dinosaurs yeah (laughs) <laughs> in Canada, in Alberta, the Philip J. Curry Museum is launching what they're calling a Paleontologist for a Day program this summer. And visitors can sign up to join a real dinosaur dig at the Pipestone Creek Bone Bed, which is right next door. And it costs $250 per person, includes breakfast, lunch, and dinner. De- sweet deal. And you help paleontologists dig, and then museum staff will send you photos of the trip and updates on the research progress of your find, which is pretty cool. They have multiple dates in June, July, and August. You do have to be at least 14 years old, and if you are under 18, you're going to need a parent or guardian. In Libertyville, Illinois, which is near Chicago, the Bess Bauer Dunn Museum has a new life-size Dryptosaurus that welcomes visitors. And she, 
apparently the she, is a 20-foot-long carnivore made by paleo artist Tyler Keeler. And she's very scientifically accurate. She's got claws and proto feathers, and it took over a year to build. Tyler made the head back in 2009 for the museum's prehistoric Lake County exhibit. Now they have the full dinosaur. There's only a few fossils that have been found of Dryptosaurus, mostly arm and leg. So Tyler worked with uh, Richard Kissel, a scientific advisor, and based details on other known dinosaurs and obviously had a little bit of leeway. They talked about, I think uh, they gave her two fingers or maybe it was three. Dryptosaurus has been depicted as having either two or three fingers. So, And the Dryptosaurus is made mostly of foam. It was made from a milling machine that used data from Tyler's digital model. It has almost 200 pounds of epoxy putty. Oof. Yeah. And the proto feathers are made of synthetic fiber that look like kiwi feathers. Tyler also recently made a baby T-Rex known as Little Clint for the Dinosaur Discovery Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I think that new dinosaur at that Best Bauer Dunn Museum is part of their move. So they are kind of celebrating with a new dinosaur and a new exhibit. It's a good way to celebrate. It is. Yeah, 200 pounds. That makes the TRX dinosaur seem really light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really cool, though. And I guess they could describe it as a female, too, because if you're doing the art, you can just say whatever you want. By the way, the velociraptor we're giving away is a male. Because <laughs> Sabrina says so. Not just me. TRX dinosaurs. Oh, they say so? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In the UK, the Yorkshire Museum has a new exhibit called Yorkshire's Jurassic World, and it's a VR installation where you go to the Lake Cretaceous and you feed an Argentinosaurus. Oof. Yeah, so Sir David Attenborough opened the exhibition because why not? He does everything, <laughs> especially when it comes to VR and dinosaurs these days. That's true. And he fed the Titanosaur, and he said, quote, Sharing my passion for the natural world is something which I've done for many years. This has been through different technologies, from the days of black and white TV to color, HD, 3D, 4K, and now virtual reality. <laughs> End quote. I like how he starts with black and white TV. It yep. was a while ago. Well, he's in his 90s. Yeah, that's true. Back in Wisconsin this summer, Milwaukee County Zoo is going to have dinosaur summer camps. There's a few options. There's one called just dinos for four to five-year-olds, where they can dig for bones and do a stegosaurus stomp. I don't know what that is, but it sounds fun. And make costumes. They also have uncovering dinosaurs for six to seven-year-olds, where they can see a dinosaur exhibit and make a paleontologist kit and compare their sizes to a dinosaur. There's dinosauria for eight to nine-year-olds to learn more about dinosaurs. And fossil hunters for families. You can see the zoo's dinosaur exhibit and learn about fossils and make your own fossil. Fun for everyone. If you find yourself near Las Cruces in New Mexico, you may want to follow Colin Dunn from the Bureau of Land Management on a Saturday morning hike to see some fossilized trackways. So he leads a hike every Saturday, lasts about three hours, and the whole purpose is to educate the public about the prehistoric trackways, national monuments, important geological history. Yeah, that sounds cool. In Essex in the UK, they have a new tourist attraction. It's this 18-hole mini golf adventure course it's called mighty claws adventure golf it cost a million pounds to make and they have animatronic dinosaurs they mentioned t-rex velociraptor trodon ankylosaurus stegosaurus parasaurolophus all the hits yeah as well as a thundering waterfall and it's the second mighty claws golf course to open in the uk i'm sure we talked about the first one because it sounded kind of familiar so apparently that they're doing well, and it's based on a children's book by Nat Lertsema called The Mighty Claws Storm a Fortress. And the plan is for this one to open in mid-April. And you can storm your own fortress, I guess. I do love both mini golf and dinosaurs. Well, you should head to the UK sometime. <laughs> yeah, just, a perfectly, just for the mini golf. Yeah, perfectly reasonable way to take a transatlantic flight <laughs> <laughs> to play mini golf. <laughs> In Portland, Oregon, a demolition machine that was decorated to look like a dinosaur, like a T-Rex, tore down the former Oregon Health and Science University dentistry building. It's a pretty fun video to watch. So apparently, a 13-year-old named Gavin Cook designed the T-Rex-like head. It took him about a month to do. And the idea was that they wanted to paint this machine so that kids from the nearby children's hospital could watch it 
take down the building or, you know, eat the building. And the head looks pretty good. It does look like it has T-Rex jaws, but, you, you know, with the, the machinery type jaws. And it's painted green, yellow, and red. Yeah. I think they said that there was that hospital was right next door so the kids could see it out the window, which would make a hospital stay a lot less unpleasant. You could watch a demolition. I wouldn't even need it to be dinosaur themed. Just watching buildings get torn down <laughs> would be pretty satisfying Yeah, <laughs> in any form. One of my favorite videos as a kid was just like buildings collapsing. They had like a VHS tape. Oh. All these buildings collapsing. And then they would play them in reverse. And they would stand back up again. That was the really good part. Pretty random video you had. <laughs> yeah. Pretty great though. <laughs> Speaking of videos, it's a screen rant published uh, what I thought was an interesting post about how Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom's biggest challenge is to make the dinosaurs scary again. I disagree, but go on. <laughs> Before we get too into this post, do you have some spoilers for the new movie? Yeah, that's Sabrina's way of giving a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't want to know about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, skip ahead a little bit. Yeah, well, so the article talks about how the dinosaurs became less impressive and more familiar throughout the series. The hook is that, quote, humans must pay the ultimate price for tampering with nature, end quote. And they said that there are still some suspenseful sequences in the other movies, like the raptors and the tall grass in Lost World as an example, but there aren't as many of those as there were in the first movie. And Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom seems to have a darker tone based on the Super Bowl trailer, though there were some components that they said, quote, will inevitably keep dinosaurs from reaching their full unnerving potential, see Blue the raptor becoming Owen's partner in crime, <laughs> end quote. They said that they do hope the movie will shock the audience with a terrifying experience, but Garrett, you think they've always been pretty terrifying? Well, so the familiarity of a species as a concept for it not being scary is kind of strange to me because what species is more familiar than humans? And yet there are tons of horror movies in which humans are very scary. <laughs> I think it's just the way that they've approached them. They've gone from like a more horror movie style in the first movie to a little bit more like PG-13 kid-friendly sort of style in the later movies. So it's really just the way that they're portraying the dinosaurs. It's really easy to make dinosaurs scary. Yeah. Well, I think that was some of the details of the article was T-Rex was this big scary creature in the first one. And then in Jurassic Park 3, all of a sudden it's Spinosaurus and not really much of a focus on T-Rex. Or the Velociraptors in, was it the second one, The Last World, where they all of a sudden they're a family working together. Kind of thing. Yeah, I think yeah. that was also a little bit in the third one, but I don't know. Also, there are hundreds of new dinosaurs that they could introduce, and then all of a sudden you don't have to worry about them being too familiar because there are all sorts of crazy things that they haven't gone through. They could throw a Therizinosaurus in there, just have a crazy herbivore slashing stuff up with his huge claws. That's true. Yeah, I think it's very easy to make dinosaurs scary as long as you're willing to do it. Well, it looks like they will in... Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and especially with the new Indoraptor. I hope so. At least in the trailer, they did a good job with that suspense, the claw coming out. Think Geek also had a really fun April Fool's joke. They published a Jurassic World detection system, <laughs> which, <laughs> yeah, they didn't actually sell it, which is kind of unfortunate. I think I might have actually bought it. I clicked the buy link just to see if I could. April Fool's. Yeah, and it's like, April Fool's, you can't actually buy this. Would you really want it? There's not much to it. <laughs> I think it's kind of fun. It's like, it's kind of a neat coaster. We've spent a fair amount on coasters in the past. It's only $19. <laughs> and what it, what it is is basically they say that it's a glass, a nice glass tumbler, and you fill it with water, and then it's got this picture on it, and it says basically dinosaur detection system with different ripple levels. So ripple level four has a picture of a T-Rex and level three has a Triceratops. Level two has like a Dakota Raptor type, you know, some sort of large Raptor. And then level one is just an egg, which is still. So that means that it's safe. And then they say possible dinosaur for ripple level two, dinosaur approaching for ripple level three, and ripple level four says run attack imminent. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and then they made a funny little video of a guy in his office 
and he had the detection system or she i forget if it was a man or a woman so they knew to run away whereas everybody else was getting attacked by this dinosaur which was a guy in a t-rex inflatable costume as per <laughs> usual That's pretty good. knocking people over so yeah they claim that it was officially licensed Jurassic World dinosaur detection system. I wonder if they actually did work with Jurassic World because they do have the branding all over it. But maybe since it doesn't actually exist, they didn't need to. I don't know. <laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> but it's pretty cool. I enjoyed that joke. And I really like thinking. I really like a lot of the products on Think Geek, so especially enjoyable. And thanks to Marcos for sharing a bunch of dinosaur toys with us on Instagram. Speaking of dinosaur related products. So there have been a ton of toys coming out because of Jurassic World, and they're all Jurassic World themed and officially licensed and all that good stuff. They have two versions of the T-Rex. Oh, by the way, this is all made by Mattel. They switched from Hasbro after last year. And from what I saw on Instagram, people are very excited about this because apparently Hasbro did not make the kind of quality and products that people were excited about, but it looks like Mattel is doing a better job. So these two versions of the T-Rex, there's a thrash and throw T-Rex, which costs 40 bucks. And there's actually a video of Bryce Dallas Howard, who plays Claire, playing with this thing. <laughs> and basically what it does is, I think you press a button on it or you twist its tail or something to wind it up. And it walks a little bit or makes walking sounds so you can make it walk. And then it clamps its mouth closed and it shakes around a little bit. And then it opens its mouth. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put a little figurine in its mouth. So you like aim it down and grab something and then shake it. And then <laughs> <laughs> when it opens its mouth, it goes flying. So that's the thrashing and throw feature. Really what it's doing is making noises and its mouth open and closes. But pretty cool. It's kind of enjoyable. And then they also have the super colossal T-Rex, which I think I like a little bit better. It's three feet long. It only costs 55 bucks, which is pretty good. And they say it can swallow up to 20 mini action figure dinosaurs whole. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's so big. Yeah. It's basically hollow. So there's a hole in the back of its mouth and you can throw the figurines down. <laughs> and then there's a little latch on its stomach you can open to get them back out. So that's pretty great. There's also a Carnotaurus that chomps when you press a button on its back. And there's also a Gallimimus, Baryonyx, Triceratops, Velociraptor, and Metriacanthosaurus that all have various sort of features. And I really, really, they made a Metriacanthosaurus. Yeah, I thought that was cool, <laughs> yeah. considering we were just talking about that last week. And it played such a small role. It did. So maybe it'll be bigger in this movie? I don't know. But it's, it's just cool that they have real dinosaurs and not a lot of fake ones. Although apparently they did also make a villain dino, whatever that's supposed to I be. I think it's the new one. Could be. And they did a bunch of dinosaur masks as well as mini dino packs, which look like little mini figurines. And then there are action figures. There's a matchbox, Jurassic World Jeep, and a gyrosphere that it looks like the action figures can go in. They also made an Uno game <laughs> that sits inside a Dilophosaurus mouth. <laughs> and apparently, if you draw an attack card, you have to press down on its head or something. And then it might spray out a bunch of cards at you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> kind of like the Dilophosaurus spitting venom like it did in the movie. And they have a Pteranodon attached to a drone that costs 100 bucks. It's basically just a Pteranodon. It looks like it's kind of glued to the top of a quadcopter. So lots of toys already coming out. Mattel on their website looks like it's sold out of everything. I don't know if it was ever actually in stock there or if other people got to sell the stuff first. But a lot of people are posting on Instagram that they're buying them at Walmart. So apparently, if you're near Walmart, you can buy them. There isn't a single Walmart in Taiwan, so we cannot buy them. <laughs> but that might be good because I'd want to buy the three foot long one and that'd be hard to get back to the States. <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy a separate suitcase just for that toy. Yeah, it might be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have another word from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. And the Royal Tyrrell Museum has their annual speaker series going on right now, which brings world-renowned scientists and researchers to the museum and offers them a platform to discuss hot topics in paleontology, as well as share results of their current research with the public. And the Royal Tyrrell Museum is the only museum in Canada dedicated exclusively to the science of paleontology. The speaker series, if you happen to be in Drumheller, 
are held every Thursday at 11 a.m. in the Museum Auditorium between now and... Actually, they only have a couple more left because we are in April. Time's running out. You better get to that museum. Yes, but if you can't, don't worry because they post all of their videos to YouTube. All of this year's speaker series will be available on YouTube, and they also have previous talks from other years. Lots of good dinosaur ones in the mix. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a good one coming up. Actually, the next one, which will be on April 12th, is with Balor Minjin, who is from the Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs, and she will be talking about the fossils of Mongolia. There are a lot of good ones in that Mongolia. They definitely deserve a new museum to feature all of their awesome dinosaurs. Yeah. So if you're interested in watching her talk, then make sure you make it to this talk. Or if you can't make it, then wait a little while and it'll be on YouTube and you can watch it that way. And we'll be posting the link in our show notes so you can easily check it out. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Stygimowak, which is a dinosaur that will be in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And it was also a request from Marcos via Facebook who sent us many links about this, and from Dinosaur4602 via YouTube. So thanks. So, Stygimoak, there was an official Snapchat post for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom that confirmed that this dinosaur will be in the movie. Don't know yet to what extent, but should be cool. Hopefully that's not a spoiler that upsets anybody. We all knew there were going to be dinosaurs in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and ones that weren't necessarily in the other movies. Yeah. It was a pachycephalosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now the U.S. It was found in the Hell Creek Formation, Ferris Formation, and Lance Formation, and several individuals have been found. It was described in 1983 by Peter Galton and Hans Dieter Seuss, and the type species is Stygimoac spinifer. The name Stygimoac means Styx demon. S-T-Y-X. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because it comes from the river Styx, which ran through the underworld in Greek mythology. And it also comes from Moloch, which is the name of a Canaanite god because it looked so bizarre. So it's kind of a demonic kind of name, sort of like Diablo Ceratops. Exactly. So Stygia Moloch was an herbivore that may have been about 10 feet or over 3 meters long, and it lived in the same time and place as Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. It had an unusual looking skull. It had these clusters of spikes on the back of the skull with one long central horn that was surrounded by two to three smaller horns or hornlets. And it had short hornlets on its nose and a pair of large backward pointing spikes on the back corners of its skull, though it's not clear what that was used for. It had a relatively small flattened dome, so it probably didn't do much headbutting. Oftentimes, these types of dinosaurs are depicted as headbutters. Yeah, it's related, at least, to Pachycephalosaurus, which sometimes is depicted at it, as it. But the research on that kind of goes back and forth as to whether or not their necks could handle it anyway. Yes. But the skull ornamentation, so it may have been used for display or defense or for shoving matches. Maybe they locked their horns, kind of like what deer do. Or maybe they were trying to inflict pain on each other when butting flanks instead of butting heads. There's one article that referenced a Stygimolic skull that was on auction in New York a few years back, but I couldn't find out what happened to it or who ended up buying it. So hopefully it's somebody who can study it more closely. Like a museum. And then Stygimolic is part of a controversy. Yeah. <laughs> so back in... 2007, Jack Horner and Mark Goodwin proposed at SVP this idea that Pachycephalosaurus, Stygimoloch, and Draco Rex were all Pachycephalosaurus, and they just represented a growth series, and then they published a paper on this in 2009. So they considered here Draco Rex to be the juvenile, though Bob Bakker and others in 2006, when they named Draco Rex, had determined that the Draco Rex specimen was an adult based on the ornamentation on its skull and fused bones. And also in 2002, Williamson and Carr agreed with Goodwin and others from a paper back in 1998 that found that these taxa were distinct based on horn size and head shape. Pachycephalosaurus had a larger, more round skull and Stygimoloch had longer horns and a narrower dome, and Stygimoloch had longer horns and a narrower dome, 
And then Draco Rex, when it was named in 2006, was described as not having a dome, but it had large horns and large temporal holes in the skull. So three very different heads. However, Horner argued that we don't know exactly how big or how old any dinosaur species could get, and that juvenile skulls can look very different from adult skulls. The idea for lumping these three together was that long, sharp horns grew out of the back of the head for the first half of the dinosaur's life, and then the horns were reduced as they reached maturity, and as the horns shrunk, the flat forehead grew and expanded into a solid dome, and also the large openings in the skull would have closed when it aged. And by that logic, Draco Rex would have been a half-grown juvenile, Stygimoloch would be three-quarters grown, and Pachycephalosaurus would be an adult. If you want to learn more about Pachycephalosaurus, we cover it in depth in episode 93. Bob Bakker said that he has studied horn and dome growth in modern animals that butt heads, and none of them show a reversal of horn development. And the same goes for well-known horn dinosaurs, though Triceratops horns do grow larger and its skull does change a lot during growth. Bakker also said that they looked at a juvenile pachycephalosaurus skull, which was about two-thirds the length of an adult pachycephalosaurus skull, and that it had a really similar shape to the adult skull, with small horns, no holes in the skull, and a large dome. And that skull is similar in size to the Draco Rex skull that they found, but the two skulls look very different. Bakker said he and a team compared Stygimoloch specimens with Draco Rex and found that their skulls were also similar in size, so the differences in their skulls weren't due to age differences, also known as ontogenetic development. He also said that these Pachycephalosaur dinosaurs, including Pachycephalosaurus, Stygimoloch, and Draco Rex, probably all grew kind of like how Triceratops grew, where bumps and horns got bigger as they aged, but no growth reversal. Yeah, that's an especially weird thing because Horner's proposing that the horns on the back of the skull actually got smaller into these little bumps as Pachycephalosaurus, which is a very strange thing to happen. Usually ornamentation gets bigger. So yeah, a lot of controversy over this. And then Pete Larson posted photos of a Stygimoloch that he was working on between October 2016 and June 2017. And in these tweets, he tweeted them, he said he found enough differences in the skull to make Stygimoloch a distinct genus, though I couldn't find a paper of his findings. I'm guessing maybe it's not ready or... Maybe I just couldn't find it. But he found a pathology on the longest horn on the left squamosal, which is in the back of the head. And this is a bacterial infection. He also found stapes, which are the bone in the middle ear. And the first recognized disarticulated vomer in a pachycephalosaur, which is this small thin bone that separates the left and right nasal cavities, as well as elements of the sclerotic ring that was around both its eyes. Oh, those are really cool. Yeah. In one of these papers about these dinosaurs, there was a comment that said that there's a complication in that a pachycephalosaurus skull found in the same quarry where Sue the T-Rex was excavated was about the same size as the Draco Rex and Stygimoloch skulls found with a dome size that was in the middle of the two, which could show the ontogeny, the growth series. But it had short spiked nodes on the back of its head instead of long spikes, which was similar to adult Pachycephalosaurus. And this could mean that long spikes just vary within Pachycephalosaurus. There seems to be variation in Pachycephalosaurus squamosal in the back of the head. Or this could be a distinct feature of Stygimoloch. Also, Pachycephalosaurus and Stygimoloch specimens were found in different stratigraphies, though this type of data wasn't really collected for historical Pachycephalosaurus specimens, so it all comes down to we need more data. And in 2010, Nick Longrich and others published a study that suggested that all flat-skulled Pachycephalosaurs were juveniles, but again, we just need more fossils. And I really liked this quote from Bob Bakker. He said, he wrote, quote, the key to accurate interpretations of a fossil species is to be prepared to be surprised. Do not assume that all the ancient creatures and ecosystems fit neatly into the ecological typecasting of modern species, end quote. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. The TED Talk with Jack Horner about this is also really good. I think it's titled something like, Where Are All the Baby Dinosaurs? Yeah. <laughs> and it's where he both proposes, at least in, in the TED format, that Triceratops and Taurosaurus are the same and that Stygimoloch, Draco Rex, and Pachycephalosaurus are all the same. And he talks about how in his belief, by looking at these thin slices of the histology of the bones, 
you can see that it's more spongy in Draco Rex and Stygi Moloch, and that's because it isn't totally evolved or <laughs> that it isn't fully developed and therefore isn't completely solid and adult bone like you see in Pachycephalosaurus. Yeah. But not everybody agrees with that analysis. No. But it is a good talk to watch. And there's also a good video of Bob Bakker talking about his Draco Rex. So hard to say. Need more fossils. <laughs> As always. And our fun fact of the day is that Paranthodon africanus was the first dinosaur discovered in Africa. It's the one I was talking about earlier that we're now pretty sure is a stegosaur, much like Stegosaurus. It was found in South Africa back in 1845, which is super early for dinosaurs. I had no idea that dinosaurs were found in South Africa that early. Yeah. And Richard Owen saw them back in the 1850s. Of course he did. Yeah, because everybody was just sending him the dinosaur stuff before they even knew it was dinosaur. And he called it the Cape Iguanodon. What? Because <laughs> he thought it, you know, I guess he saw similarities to dinosaurs. So that was one of the three that he knew about. Later, it was called an ankylosaur and a basal thyreophoran. And then, like I mentioned earlier, now we think it's a stegosaur. Cool. Yeah. So Africa has a long history of dinosaur discoveries, even longer than I knew before. <laughs> Pretty awesome. On that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to check our show notes so that you can enter to win our Velociraptor giveaway. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Make sure you don't miss out on any episodes. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.